video update for a while. Uh, it's um, August uh, the 14th, um, about uh, 9.30 a.m. Uh, this is going to be a little different update to today. I'm going to talk a little bit about El Nino and um, uh, what the possible um, uh, effects would be uh, this uh, coming winter. Uh, there's a lot of uh, conversation on Twitter and in the media about uh, this uh, El Nino that we are in is going to be a uh, very strong El Nino. Some people are calling it a Godzilla El Nino. Others are Super El Nino. Uh, but uh, we do have El Ninos uh, occur every about every 10 years. And um, uh, this one is going to probably be the strongest uh, since the records were kept uh, uh, back in the 1950s. Uh, probably going to be as strong, if not stronger, than the 1997-1998 uh, El Nino. And um, I want to show you that you're going to hear a lot of predictions about the consequences uh, this winter. And the, uh, the simple truth is that uh, we know very little about what the effects of El Nino uh, are. And I want to give you uh, an example. Um, I think we'll go back to, let me minimize this one. And we're going to go to this chart. This lists, uh, this is from the National Weather Service. It lists the um, total uh, seasonal snowfall by year since uh, 1887 uh, through uh, uh, last year. And if you remember uh, in, 19, uh, in the uh, 2010 uh, period, uh, uh, we had snowmageddon, 2009-2010 uh, 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 winter. Uh, we had a huge snowfall in February. And um, it turns out that the 2009-2010 was an El Nino year. But it was only a moderate El Nino year. It was not a real strong El Nino. It wasn't weak. It wasn't strong. It was about a mid-range El Nino. And we ended up in February getting our snowmageddon, which was 32 inches of snow. You can see it right here. Um, however, the strongest El Nino uh, uh, on record um, uh, was back in 1997, 1998. That's this range. And if you look during the strongest El Nino on record, we got only a tenth of an inch of snow for the whole season. This really demonstrates that just because we have a strong El Nino or a weak El Nino or a mid-range El Nino really says very little about our snow chances uh, in the mid-Atlantic. and. Um, the only things for sure, we can go back to this chart. This actually, and I'm going to bring up a different chart too. Have them both here on the screen. Uh, this, uh, this chart over on this side is the AccuWeather analysis of what a strong El Nino uh, would impact uh, uh, on the United States uh, for this coming winter. And I actually think that this is quite uh, a good assessment of um, of the effect. There are a few things we know for sure about El Nino. Uh, when we have a strong El Nino, California gets uh, far above uh, their normal rainfall during the winter time. Uh, and uh, in fact, the entire Southwest get uh, much more rain than a normal year. We also know that we have in the Southeast, uh, actually from the uh, Florida up to um, the southern border of Virginia, this whole region in the southeast has above average precipitation. Uh, those are, are pretty well known uh, effects and they're pretty, uh, if you look statistically at the, uh, the effects over uh, several El Nino years, they're pretty, uh, pretty reliable. We also have the Midwest uh, often is, has a much more mild winter, uh, much above normal temperatures. And the, the basic reason, reason this all occurs 
is that uh, in a uh, El Nino year, strong El Nino year, uh, the jet stream splits into two pieces. We have a southern jet, which we often have, but the southern jet, jet is depressed pretty far south. Often it runs more through the uh, uh, mid-United States, but during El Nino years it's pushed down so it goes over to uh, Texas and, and Florida. Um, However, the jet stream splits in this uh, situation, too, and you have a northern jet that goes, goes far farther north than the, uh, even when we have some northern jet. It's much farther north than normal, and, and this jet stream generally blocks Arctic air from filtering in uh, to the, the lower 48. So th this does represent a pretty accurate uh, assessment of a typical strong El Nino year. Um, one thing that this uh, southern jet will do is it will make more um, coastal storms. Uh, you will normally have more uh, what's called nor nor'easters uh, come from this area of the Gulf and move up uh, in this direction and will hug the coast as a result. Um, this uh, by itself would not produce a much uh, snow, but it potentially will produce more precipitation. The issue is if this northern jet weakens, if the northern jet weakens and this uh, it will allow Arctic air to filter in and with the increased chance of coastal storms we would have a good chance of getting uh, 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 some pretty significant snowfalls. That's basically what happened during Snowmageddon. Uh, what you had was a, um, a moderate El Nino year, so we were getting more uh, storms coming up the coast, and you had a weakened, uh, in February, the northern jet weakened and that allowed Arctic air to come down, and that, that the result was uh, Snowmageddon. Um, to highlight some more issues here, let me scroll this up a little bit. And I want to show you uh, the precipitation map for the United States uh, for each of the El Nino years that we had. Um, this is the 2009-2010 Snowmageddon year, it had a strength of 1.5, uh, which is a, a moderate El Nino. And here in the, in the Virginia, D.C. area, you see a f uh, far above precipitation, higher than normal precipitation. In a, in a weak El Nino year that occurred in 2006-2007, we had about a normal precipitation for the wintertime. Another weak one occurred on 2004-2005. Uh, uh, we had a uh, 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 about an average in the winter 2002-2003. We had a moderate El Nino year there, and we had above average precipitation. In the um, the strongest El Nino that we've recorded, um, we had a, a much above average precipitation, and and so on. So. What you can see here is that if we have a El Nino that is above a strength of one, we have above above average precipitation in the mid Atlantic, and that's pretty consistent uh, over many El Ninos, and is a good suggestion that uh, we're going to see more precipitation this winter. Whether it's going to be in the form of rain, ice, or snow is a little bit up in the air. And I want to show you, you know, everybody talks about El Nino, but El Nino is only one of the uh, teleconnected uh, areas on the, on the planet that affect our weather. This, I, I want to show you this. This is all of the different uh, components that they have identified that have something to do with uh, weather in the United States and around the world. And what you, you have here, I'm going to go through them. This is the Arctic Oscillation. This is the North Atlantic Oscillation. This is the Pacific North American Pattern. This is the Eastern Pacific Oscillation. And this is the Western Pacific Oscillation. All of those are different um, areas of the ocean and the planet 
that uh, uh, weather scientists have uh, uh, discovered have an impact on our weather. And um, as far as uh, snow in the mid-Atlantic with a strong El Nino, the, uh, there are two of these components, at least, that show a pretty good correlation of whether we're going to have snow or not have snow in a El Nino year. And those are the uh, Arctic Oscillation. In the case of the Arctic Oscillation during Snowmageddon, we, the Arctic Oscillation went negative, and as it's showing here, it's below the, the center line. And when the Arctic Oscillation went negative in the 2009-2010 February uh, time frame, that caused the northern jet to weaken and allowed uh, Arctic air to spill down uh, into the mid-Atlantic. Uh, so that's one component we're going to have to be watching as we approach um, uh, winter time and uh, after we're in the winter uh, a bit. Also, the uh, Pacific uh, North American pattern also seems to correlate with uh, a potential of, um, of uh, the northern jet stream breaking down during a strong El Nino year. And uh, again, if the, uh, the PNA uh, goes negative uh, during the winter time, it's probably going to mean that if we have a coastal storm about the same time that it goes negative, uh, we're going to have, uh, have a significant snowfall. So really, um, anyone who says they can predict the snow this far in advance is uh, fooling themselves. Uh, there's really going to be, uh, it's going to be very hard for anybody to uh, really accurately predict uh, this far out. That being said, some of the long-range models suggest that February does have a chance of a significant snowfall in the uh, mid-Atlantic. So we're going to, it, it really, the long range is saying that we're going to have a fairly warm December and January, uh, but February is the month to watch. So we'll have to see how this develops, and I'll definitely keep you up to date uh, as uh, time goes on. Probably we're not going to get a real a a accurate uh, picture until um, early November about uh, this winter. Okay, if you have any questions, um, just give me a tweet, at Pat Penn, P-A-T-P-E-N-D, and I'll do my best to answer them. Bye-bye.